Oh my God, Bill. Are you seriously going back to your parents' house? Even they didn't want to be there. After we told them what happened and showed them the history of the house, they moved out and moved in with us. Remember? Melinda said in shock as we sat at our kitchen table, drinking our morning cups of coffee and hot chocolate. Yes, my parents did move out. And yes, they did move in with us. But they still own the property. Anyway, I've got to know what's behind that piece of wood, babe. I responded, taking a sip of my coffee. Why, Bill? Why do you have to know? Why can't you just leave it alone? She asked aggressively, staring me straight in the eye. Now, any man in a relationship knows that when your girlfriend, wife, or significant other is upset and is staring you directly in the eye, it is not a good thing, and you need to be very careful about what you say next. I, like an idiot, said the wrong thing. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I just have to, I replied nervously. Melinda's eyes then widened. That was the first of many oh shit moments to come. Well, this time, you're going alone. I'm staying here, she stated, and slammed her cup down hard on the table, spilling hot chocolate everywhere. She then stood up quickly, turned around, and stomped away in a huff through the kitchen door. Melinda! I called out as she left. After a few seconds, I got up from the table, grabbed a couple paper towels, and began cleaning up the mess. My mother then came through the door. Bill, what's wrong with Melinda? She seems upset. Are you two fighting? She asked, like mothers always do. No, Mom, we're not fighting. We're just disagreeing, I responded. I finished cleaning up the mess and put the cups in the dishwasher. Suddenly, Melinda came storming through the door, wearing her jacket. I'm going to have a cigarette, Bill. And don't you follow me. I mean it, she said, looking me dead straight in my face. I knew to leave her alone at that point. She then opened the back door and stomped out into the sunroom. You see, after what happened at my parents' house, Melinda and I decided to smoke outside, in the sunroom or on the front step from now on, as who knows what was on this property before we lived here. We didn't want to take any chances. Finding out the history of places can be a good thing sometimes, but we're kind of worried about researching our property after what we found out about my parents' house. I mean, this land, hell, all the land on earth, even the land that you live on, has been here for at least 2,000 years, and it wasn't always what it is now. Think about it. Anyway, the sunroom is an 8 foot by 12 foot structure off the back door. It is fully enclosed, with windows that can be opened to let air in, and closed to keep heat in and the cold out. We have a little space heater out there right now, given the fact that it's freezing outside. It keeps the room a little bit warmer, but it's still a little bit cold. Now, the sunroom is set up just like a living room. There's a white wicker couch, chair, and a coffee table out there, a small floor stand with a CD radio combo on it for when we want to rock out, and a 32-inch flat-screen TV with a cable box hooked up to it, mounted to the TV stand that it sits on so we don't miss any parts of the shows that we're watching just to have a cigarette. Yeah, yeah, I know. Shut up and tell the story. I'm sorry about that. It's a really bad habit of mine. I keep babbling on and on about useless things that no one cares about or already knows. What? The story? Oh yeah, my bad. Anyway, go talk to her, son, my mother told me. She's pissed at me, Mom, I said back. No, she's not, Bill. She might be hurt, she might be worried, but she's not mad, she said. How do you know, Mom? I asked. Because if she was, son, she would have went out front to smoke. But instead, she came all the way back here, where she knew you would be, just to tell you to leave her alone. I'm a woman. I know these things. Now go, she said, in her best mom voice. Now, I don't care how old you are, 
how tough you think you are, or even who you are. If your mother uses her mom voice on you, you do what she says. And I did. I walked to the coat rack beside the front door, grabbed my jacket, as that's where I keep my smokes, and then walked back to the kitchen. Excuse me, Mom, I said, sliding past my mother. I then walked to the back door. I looked out the window and saw Melinda sitting on the couch, smoking her cigarette with tears in her eyes. I quickly opened the door and cautiously said, M Melinda? She blew out the smoke, wiped her eyes, and hastily said, I don't want to talk to you. I then began to walk toward the couch. What do you want, Bill? She snapped. Why are you crying, babe? I asked cautiously. Melinda then threw her arms in the air, sat up quickly, and yelled sarcastically, Jeez, I don't know, Bill. Maybe because my boyfriend is going back to the house that scares the fucking shit out of me, and I'm afraid that something will happen to him, and he won't come back. Then she completely broke down in tears. I sat down next to her, put my arm around her, and let her cry on my shoulder. I leaned my head to the right and laid it on top of hers and whispered, I won't go if it upsets you this much. She then lifted her head and wiped her eyes. No, she said sharply. I'm not the kind of girl to stop you from doing what you want to do just because I don't want you to do it. Go, get it out of your system, Bill. I'll be here waiting when you get back. She then smiled and kissed me. I lit a cigarette and said, I'll keep my cell phone on me the whole time. If you get worried, hun, just call me. I will answer, I assured her. She looked at me and smiled again. She then put out her cigarette and held my hand. I finished smoking mine, put it out, and we walked inside together. I'm going to get my stuff, hun, and put it in the car, I said. I'll be right back. Okay, hun, Melinda responded. I walked out to the garage, leaving my mom and Melinda in the kitchen. I gathered all my tools, well, the ones I thought I would need anyway, and put them in the car, like I said. I then walked back in the house, grabbed my car keys, my wallet, and my cell phone off my dresser in our bedroom. Since I was already wearing my jacket with my smokes in the right-hand pocket, there was no need to really grab them. I then made my way to the kitchen. I walked in to see my father had joined the party. Hey, Dad, I said. I'm going to head on over to the house, like we talked about. Can I get the key? I asked. He took a drink of his coffee. He drinks coffee more than I do. Are you sure you want to do this, son? He asked. Yeah, Dad, I am, I responded. Okay, good luck. Don't destroy the place, he stated. I just smiled at him. He then reached in his pocket, took out his massive amount of keys, fumbled around with them, found the house key, took it off the ring, and handed it to me. Thanks, Dad, I said, putting it in my right front pocket. I then walked over to Melinda and gave her a kiss goodbye. I kissed my mom on the cheek as well. I'll be back in a little while, I stated, and walked out to the car. I got in and drove to my parents' house. I pulled in the driveway and just sat in the car, staring at the house for about ten minutes or so. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I was a little bit nervous about going inside, alone. You see, this was the first time that I'd been back there since that wild and crazy day. I know, I know. I went in there alone to get our smokes and to clean up, but Melinda was right outside, and that was right after it happened. It hadn't sunk in yet. I've had a couple weeks to actually think about it, and have had a few bad dreams about it, so yeah, I was a little bit nervous. Now, I know what you're thinking. You said that your parents moved in with you. Well, didn't you help them move all their things out of the house and over to storage? And the answer to that would be no. My parents decided that since they were getting older and knew that they couldn't take any of their stuff with them when they died, 
that it would be best if they donated it all, except for some clothes, a couple family heirlooms, and all their toiletries to the local Goodwill. They came and picked it all up. They gave away some furniture and such to some friends, and Melinda and I took a few things to remember them by, but most of it went to Goodwill. Now, my father is a very stubborn man and wouldn't let me carry any of the three boxes of stuff that they brought with them. My stuff, my job, he said. Anyway, I rolled down the driver's side window, lit a cigarette, smoked it, contemplated going home while doing so, decided against it, put my cigarette out in the ashtray, grabbed my tool bag, got out of the car, and walked to the front door. That was a decision that I would later regret. I put the key in the lock, turned it, heard the mechanism unlock, and turned the knob. I then slowly pushed the door open. It gave off an eerie creaking sound as it did. It's never done that before, I thought. I then stepped inside, setting my tool bag on the floor after removing the key from the lock and putting it back in my right front pocket. The bag hit the hardwood where a throw rug once sat. I then got the feeling that something was off. You know, like when you walk into a room and you get the overwhelming feeling that you shouldn't be there? You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, it felt like that. I then looked around. The entire place was empty and absent of life. Gone was the big leather couch that I hopped on as a child. Gone was the end table that I hit, head first, when I slipped and fell while hopping on the couch as a child. The fish tank was gone. The TV was gone. The huge family picture that hung over the fireplace was gone. Every single thing was gone. I just stood there for a moment, feeling really sad. Maybe that's it. I've never seen this place empty before, I thought. At least, I don't remember seeing it empty. I shrugged it off took a deep breath, composed myself, picked up my tool bag, and then briskly walked to the dining room. The sound of my boots hitting the hardwood echoed throughout the house, making it more creepy. I reached the dining room and walked in. Everything was gone there too. I then walked through the empty room, through the swinging door, and into the kitchen. The air was bitter cold. I had goosebumps on my arm for God's sakes. It was that cold. It reminded me of the day that I will never forget. Oh shit moment number two. Not again, I fearfully said to myself. I just stood there, frozen, shaking, and scared shitless. Wait a minute, there's no smoke. What the hell? What's causing it to be this cold then? I asked myself. At that very moment, I faintly heard the sound of a car horn in the distance, people talking, and dogs barking outside. It was then that I realized that somebody had left one of the kitchen windows open. That's why it's so cold in here, I thought, feeling relieved. I quickly shut that window. I then turned around and saw the one thing that I came there for, that piece of wood. I walked over to it, put my hand on it, and said, What secrets do you hide? As I put my bag on the floor once again, I rubbed my hand up and down that piece of wood. I don't know why, I just did. Anyway, I bent down, reached in my bag, pulled out my drill, placed the bit in the top left screw, and pressed the button. I repeated the same sequence of events for all 52 of the screws. After removing all of them, I tried to move that piece of wood, but it wouldn't move. I soon realized that not only was it screwed to the wall, it was also glued there. Man, somebody really wants to keep this board in place, I thought. I grabbed my hammer from out of my bag, shimmied the claw between the wood and the wall, then carefully pried the wood free. I then slowly began to lower it after putting my hammer back in the bag. Now, before I tell you what I found behind it, I've got to admit something first. 
I was 100% wrong. When I thought that it was the hospital that boarded up the basement, it was not the hospital. No. Now, if you remember, the entire hospital facility burned to the ground in 1908, so there wouldn't be anything left to board up, right? Then, the house was rebuilt using the original blueprints by who? That's right, the church. It was the church that boarded up the basement, not the hospital. I didn't realize that until I got down there. Anyway, like I said, I slowly began to lower the board. Here comes oh shit moment number three. As I did, the smell of stale air hit my nose. Mixed with it was the stench of old blood, mold, dirty water, rot, and decay, and who knows what the hell else. I quickly dropped the board to the floor as I turned away from the opening. It hit with a loud thud. I covered my mouth, bent over, and began breathing through my nose. It took everything I had not to puke all over the floor. It was bad. Really, really bad. After a few minutes, I composed myself. Oh my god! What the fuck is that smell? I said loudly. I then turned back around. Now, what I saw on the back of that board, I did not expect to see. It was a huge white cross, painted on the back, and what looked to be a line of salt, scotch tape to the bottom of it. That's strange, I thought. Well, if that's not strange enough, there were multiple sets of what I can only describe as claw marks. Three claw marks within the entire cross. Hell, they practically covered the entire board. That's not good, I told myself. Yeah, no shit, myself told myself. I then heard from the basement what sounded like glasses clanking together just once. It reminded me of the final scene in that cult classic movie, The Warriors, when the gang that actually killed the guy catches up with the Warriors. Wait a minute, I'm doing it again, aren't I? Telling you useless information that has nothing to do with the story. Damn, I gotta stop doing that. Anyway, I turned and looked into pure darkness. What the fuck was that? I said to myself. I quickly reached in my front pocket, pulled out my cell phone, turned on the flashlight, and shined it into the basement. Hello? Anybody there? I cautiously asked to the open air, praying to God that no one answered. Now, as I stood there, shining my light into the darkness below, my cell phone began to play just you and I. You know, that old country song by Eddie Rabbit and Crystal Gale? It's mine and Melinda's song. I have it set up as my ringtone for whenever she calls me, with a picture of us standing by the lion's den at the zoo, appearing on the screen. Anyway, you don't really care about that. Now, right before I turned off the light to answer the phone, I could have sworn I saw something move. I shrugged it off and answered the phone. Hey, babe, I said. Yes, babe, I'm fine. I just removed the board, and I'm about to go down there. Okay, babe, I will. I love you, too. Bye. I then hung up the phone. I stood the board up and slid it to the right, leaning it up against the wall. I turned the flashlight on my phone back on and prepared to enter the basement. I took a step onto the first step of the staircase, as that was the only step visible from where I was standing. I then shined the light onto the remaining steps as I took another step. Oh shit moment number four. The light then showed that there were no more steps and that the rest of the wooden staircase had rotted and fallen to the floor below. I freaked out as my foot was coming down on nothing. I began to lose my balance at that point. I turned around quickly, feeling myself begin to fall. I frantically reached out for the edge of the wall, grabbing a hold of it and balancing myself. 
I then stepped back into the kitchen, thankful to be alive. I thanked God right there, then went outside in the freezing cold to have a cigarette. I didn't care at that point. I really needed one. As I stood there, freezing and smoking my cigarette, I thought about how I was going to get down there. Let's see. Option one, jump and probably break my leg. So, no. Option two, go to the car, get the toe strap out of the trunk, tie it around the island in the kitchen, and use it to rappel into the basement. Yeah, we're going to go with option two, I thought. I quickly ran to the car. I opened the driver's side door, tossing my cigarette to the ground. I reached in, popped the trunk, ran around the back of the car, opened the trunk, grabbed the toe strap and my gloves, closed the trunk, closed the driver's side door, and ran back to the back door. I walked in and quickly shut the door behind me. I then proceeded to wrap the strap around the island and tied it together. I then pulled back hard on the strap to make sure that it would stay tied and walked over to the opening. I grabbed the hammer from out of my bag once again, bent down and hit the first step really hard a couple times, breaking it into pieces and causing it to fall to the floor as well. I put the hammer back in my bag, stood back upright, put on my gloves, grabbed the strap and pulled it again. I grabbed the other end of the strap and tied it around the handles of my tool bag and lowered it into the basement, keeping hold of the strap. Now, again, I know what you're thinking. Why did you do that? Well, I was hearing noises down there, and I didn't know what it was. I at least wanted a weapon in case I needed one. Screwdrivers can do a lot of damage. Anyway, a soft thud was heard as it hit the concrete floor. I turned around and walked backwards to the edge of the floor. I positioned myself so that my toes were on the floor and my heels were dangling in midair. Just then, my phone rang again. I held on to the strap with my left hand, took off my right glove, reached in my pocket with my right hand, and looked at who was calling. It was Melinda again. Hello, I said, slightly annoyed, as I really wanted to get into that basement. Yes, I'm fine. I'm about to go into the basement. Well, there were complications. What? Yes, I'll pick up milk on the way home. Okay? Yeah, love you too. Bye. I put the phone back in my pocket, put on my glove, and grabbed the strap. I pulled it tight, said a little prayer, and then slowly lowered myself backwards, moving hand over hand on the strap. I then lowered myself into darkness. After a few seconds of practically shitting myself, scared to death that the strap was going to break, I felt my heels hit the wall. I thought about jumping again, but with my luck, I'd probably land on a rusty nail, driving it through the sole of my boot into my foot and need to get a tetanus shot as well as break my leg. So again, I decided against that idea. I then slowly began moving down the wall. Hand over hand, baby step, hand over hand, baby step, I repeated to myself as I slowly moved down the wall. After about the third or fourth time, my left foot hit something. I took off my right glove again, pulled my phone out of my pocket again, turned on the light and shined it downward. My left foot had hit a piece of the broken steps, so I knew I was on the ground at that point. I maneuvered around the broken steps, let go of the strap, took off my left glove, put both my gloves in my tool bag, and just stood there. After a few seconds, I untied the bag from the strap, grabbed a screwdriver out of the bag, and held it in my left hand. I then began to slowly move my flashlight around to see what was down there. Now, I'm sure that all of you have been in a basement at some point in your life and have seen pipes on the ceiling, a water heater in the corner, 
maybe even a, a heating unit, along with various pieces of junk, right? Well, not this basement. It had none of that. When I first saw what was down there, it kind of creeped me out. Nah, I'm lying. It really creeped me out. The floor was made of concrete. The walls were made of cinder block, with what appeared to be several streams of water going from the ceiling to the floor, but no water on the floor. There were also chains and shackles, with a padlock on each shackle, hanging in several places on the wall. The ceiling appeared to be wooden planks, turned sideways, making up the floor in the kitchen. There were claw marks, just like the ones in that piece of wood, all around the walls. There were huge bloodstains on the floor, several pages of the Holy Bible scattered all over it, as the bindings were thrown all about as well. Some pages even had blood on them. There were pieces of what appeared to be broken mason jars on top of the pages. What the hell? I thought. I then shined my light to the right to see a small metal cot with a torn to shreds mattress on it. There were little metal chains about a foot long in each corner of the cot. The chains had shackles on the end of them with a padlock as well. Anyway, moving my light to the left, I saw a chair. It was very similar to the one that the guy in the red helmet was sitting in when we traveled back in time. It had the same chains and shackles as the cot and the wall did. What the fuck kind of crazy shit happened down here? I thought. Wait a minute. The hospital burned down. It was rebuilt by the church. What the fuck? People were chained to a cot, chained to a chair, chained to the wall, and the place is owned by a church? Yeah, no fucking way. They must have used the house as a recovery center and the basement for exorcisms. Yeah, well, you know what? Fuck this. I am out of here, I said aloud. Now, brace yourself. Oh shit moment number five is on its way. I then quickly moved my light to the left. The light caught something standing in the corner as it passed. I nearly pissed myself. Actually, I think I did, just a little bit, when I saw it. What the fuck is that? I said, slowly shining my light back into the corner. It was, quote unquote, Melinda, standing there, completely naked. Now, under normal circumstances, I would have been the happiest man in the world. But these circumstances were far from normal. Anyway, I screamed like a little schoolgirl and quickly stepped back, keeping my light directly on her. No fucking way, I said, rubbing my eyes and not believing what I was seeing. She just stood there. Now, I would have to be a complete moron or a total idiot if I thought that that was actually Melinda, knowing damn well that it wasn't. I mean, that Melinda had green eyes. The real Melinda's eyes are blue. And why would she be standing naked in the corner of the basement in a house that she's scared to death of? I then tightened my grip on the screwdriver and stepped back even further. Suddenly... Melinda raised her arms in front of her and slowly spoke. Love me, darling. Now, if this was a horror movie, I, being the main character, would have went to her and we probably would have started making out or something stupid like that. But this was no movie. This was real life. Anyway, love me, darling... Melinda doesn't talk like that, I thought. What the fuck is going on here? Melinda has blue eyes, not green, and she's never once said the word darling. Who the fuck are you? What the fuck are you? And how do you look like my girlfriend? I screamed. I then blinked my eyes. What number am I on? Oh yeah, moment number six. When I opened them again, Melinda was gone and I saw the creature in its normal form. Well, creature is too lax of a word. It was a demon. 
Now, when you think of the word demon, you probably think of red skin, black eyes, and black horns, right? Well, not this demon, no. It had reddish-white transparent skin. I could see all of its muscles and its internal organs through it. Its arms and its legs were very muscular, but it had no genitalia. It looked like an, like an evil version of a Ken doll down there. It had three finger claws for hands, with sharp white nails and black goat hoofs for feet. It had big, bright white eyes, sharp pointy ears that were very similar to Mr. Spock's, two little holes where its nose should have been, a mouth that stretched from ear to ear, bright white horns protruding from either side of its head, and what looked to be an inverted cross carved into the middle of its forehead. It then let out this high-pitched growl, showing a mouthful of black, broken, rotten human teeth. Its breath smelled like burnt flesh, rotten potatoes, and foot sweat all mixed together. I could smell it from where I was standing. Now, remember when I said I pissed myself a little when I first saw something standing in the corner? Well, this time, <laughs> I actually did. I'm not ashamed to admit it. It happens. Don't judge. Anyway, I just stood there, frozen in fear and pissing myself. Suddenly, with lightning speed, it lunged forward, grabbed me, and slammed me back first, hard against the wall. It hurt like a son of a bitch. I screamed out in pain and dropped my phone. The phone just so happened to land with the light shining up toward the ceiling dimly lighting up the room, but I still kept a hold of the screwdriver. My legs then gave out as I began to fall to the floor. The demon then lifted me high above its head. Now, it may have been a ghoulish demon from hell, but it spoke perfect English. Being such as I possess the ability to mimic the one thing that our prey truly desires. I saw her on that thing before you started talking to it, it said in a deep demonic voice. Prey, I thought, this thing's gonna kill me. That is the exact reason why I wanted a weapon. I summoned every ounce of energy that I had, primal screamed, and then plunged that screwdriver deep into the side of its head, all the way down to the handle. It then released me and stepped back, screeching as it did. I landed on my feet and just watched. Oh shit moment number seven. I was completely horrified when its screeching turned to demonic laughter as it reached up with its right arm and pulled the screwdriver out of its head, still laughing as it did. A neon green gooey-like substance then began pouring from the hole and dripping off the shaft of the screwdriver. The demon then proceeded to lick and suck the substance off the shaft. Its tongue was long and split. I screamed and made a mad dash for the strap, but I wasn't fast enough. The demon caught me before I even got close. It shoved me back against the wall once again and placed the screwdriver under my chin, the tip pressing hard against my skin. You should not have done that. I was going to let you live. After all, you have set me free. But now you must die. A death well deserved. It has been so long since I feasted on the blood of a human. Now, Prepare to die, it said. Wait, wait a minute. I'll give you anything you want, anything at all. Just please don't kill me, I screamed in fear. Just then, my phone, which was lying on the floor, began to play that song again. Melinda, I whispered. There was no way that I could answer it. The demon then turned its head to look at it and then turned back to me. It smiled a devilish grin and said, Deal. It removed the screwdriver from my chin, dropped it to the floor, 
let me go, and again with lightning speed, jump from where it was standing, all the way up to the opening. What do you want? I screamed. It did not answer me. Oh shit, moment number eight. It turned to look at me, laughed, and then quickly began pulling the strap upward. Again, I made a mad dash for it, and again, I was not fast enough. I jumped in the air, under the opening, trying to grab the end of it, and missed. The demon then stood up, and vanished into thin air. What do you want? I screamed again. Then I thought, how the fuck am I gonna get out of here? I walked over, picked up my phone, and tried to call Melinda back. She did not answer. Using the light on my phone, I then picked up the screwdriver and walked back underneath the opening. I just stood there for a few moments, racking my brain, trying to figure out a way to get out of there. I then looked at all the claw marks in the cinder blocks. Some of them were deep. For some reason, I put my finger in one of them. Then it hit me. If the holes were big enough, I could climb out, I thought. Now, given the fact that I'm about six foot two, with very long arms, I could almost reach the bottom of the opening, so I knew my plan would work. I then grabbed my tool bag, zipped it up, and tossed it through the opening, praying that I did not break my drill. A hard thud was heard soon after. I then frantically began stabbing the cinder blocks with the screwdriver, making some of the scratch marks into holes, big enough for the toe of my boot to fit in and my fingers to grab onto. I soon realized that doing that would take far too long. I had another idea. I quickly ran over to the cot, threw the mattress on the floor, and dragged the frame over to the opening and stood it up. It came about halfway up the wall. I put the screwdriver in my back pocket and my phone in my front pocket after turning off the light. I then began to climb the metal spring undercarriage. I got to the top of it and reached up with my left hand, grabbing a hold of the floor. I then reached up with my right hand, grabbing the floor as well. I held on tight to the floor as I moved my legs up the undercarriage. I got up as far as I could go, standing on the frame. I then hoisted myself up and out of the basement. The frame then fell to the floor. I quickly untied the strap, grabbed my tool bag, and got the hell out of there, swearing to God that I'd never come back. That did not happen. Anyway, I quickly ran to the car, threw my stuff in the back seat, got in, fired her up, put it in reverse, and hit the gas into oncoming traffic. I didn't care at that point, I just wanted to get the hell out of there. The sound of car horns and squealing tires filled the air. Thank God that no one hit me. I then drove to the coffee shop across the street from Barnaby's and got the largest cup of coffee that they had, with cream and sugar of course, then sat in the car trying to calm down before I went home and trying to think of what the demon wanted from me. I then remembered I had to pick up milk. So, I went to my favorite place to shop. That's right, Barnaby's. I grabbed the milk and was halfway down the aisle when it hit me. Oh shit moment number nine. The demon agreed to the deal just as Melinda was calling me. He wants Melinda. No! I screamed, dropping the milk and scaring the hell out of some little kid that was shopping with her mom. Anyway, I ran like a wild man to the car and broke the sound barrier to get home. I burst through the front door. Melinda! Melinda! I screamed, checking every room downstairs. I then ran upstairs, still screaming, Melinda! My mom then came out of the guest room door. I almost ran her over. I stopped quickly and asked her frantically, Mom, Mom, have you seen Melinda? Um, uh, she went to go lay down, Bill. Are you okay? She asked, confused. No, Mom, no, 
I am not, I responded, running past her down the hallway into our bedroom. I burst through that door as well. Melinda! I screamed again. She was not there. What was there were three claw marks in her pillow.